This hearing will come to order. The Oversight Committee's mission statement is, we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is our mission. Today, we are going to talk about affordable energy, the lifeblood of Americans, America's rise in a global economy. We will touch on a number of clear issues, successes and failures. First of all, the American people know well that leveraging energy more efficiently is, in fact, necessary to compete in a global environment. America produces products for a fraction of the energy used by China and other developing nations. We already are more efficient. Yet the Obama administration has systematically waged a war on carbon-based energy in pursuit of new green energy. This campaign includes aggressive regulatory programs impacting the oil, gas, and coal industries that have previously been the source of job creations and economic growth here in America, and a campaign that includes an aggressive push for government-backed, taxpayer-paid-for green energy and green jobs. Unfortunately, President Obama's green energy agenda appears to be playing favorites with certain companies. Additionally, we are well aware that there is a lot more green in the way of cash and a lot less energy and jobs than anticipated. Facing the worst economic recession since the Great Depression, President Obama confronted the economic crisis with a proposal for green jobs. He cited the efforts of other nations as a rationale for subsidized uh, our way to, to subsidize our way to new technology and energy independence. Yet at this hearing and a report released by the committee today will demonstrate the other nations who have tried the same approach have experienced mixed results at best. President, Obama's re relied, President Obama relied on a false pretense that subsidizing green energy as other nations such as Spain, Germany, and Japan did would result in good, high-wage jobs when, in actuality, nations such as Spain, Italy, Denmark, Germany, and the U.K. have struggled with job creations, <clears throat> uh, jo with, with job destruction, higher energy costs, and loss of taxpayer dollars as, they as, a, as a result of pursuing such policies. Looking back on the Obama green energy record three years and billions of taxpayer dollars later, the American people have received very little return on the President's signature investment. In practice, the, the uh, guise of green jobs has become a political rallying cry designed to unite environmentalists, union leaders, to consolidate an ideological-based agenda. This would be okay if, in fact, it produced the jobs, and it didn't. It has almost meant punishing and pushing to the edge of the envelope all others. It has meant the politicization of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which has begun using gimmick accounting methods to count green jobs. And let me emphasize, we don't count similar carbon jobs. We don't count the other jobs. This initiative ordering the counting of green jobs is very important because it is poorly defined. I might mention today the staff on both sides of the dais will be counted as green jobs created under this standard. Yes, if we talk about green jobs, if we lobby for green jobs, as a matter of fact, if you are a paid lobbyist you count for green jobs, you count as green jobs. The agenda also has been driven by political favoritism. 
And there are accusations of pay-to-play relationships benefiting private investors on the back of public loan guarantees, as in the case of Solandra. We are not here to investigate that today. Our mission is broader. It is it's seemingly at cross-purposes to President Obama's and his administration who have promoted traditional energy sources abroad through loans and, and diplomacy while openly discouraging them at home. We cannot, in fact, raise the cost of our energy while promoting other countries finding lower-cost, carbon-based energy and assume that we are being more competitive. Jobs have not been produced in a, in a sustained fashion or in the number promised, and billions of taxpayer dollars have yielded little to truly stimulate the economy all while a vital domestic engine of growth, the U.S. energy production industry, has been choked, starved, and hyper-regulated. Addressing these shortcomings will deliver on a goal that both President Obama and members of his committee share, create, and members of this committee share, creating jobs and growing the economy while delivering affordable energy to the American consumer and business. It is very clear that many of us on both sides of the aisle hoped for better than we got. Today's hearing is to come to the reality that no matter how often we hope for better, this committee has an obligation to recognize when we fail to achieve it. I now recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for calling this hearing. Uh, Madam Secretary, it is an honor, indeed a tremendous honor to have you here today. I am sure you have testimony that goes just the opposite of what the Chairman has just talked about, and I look forward to hearing it. The Administration is fortunate to have your commitment to the environment, to our economy, and to American jobs. I also welcome Deputy Secretary Poneman from the Department of Energy and Dr. Hall, a good friend from the Department of Labor. When I go home to my district in Baltimore, my constituents are clear about what they want. They want jobs. They don't care if these jobs are green, purple, or any other color, as long as they pay a fair wage and give them a sense of prosperity and a hope for their children's future. My constituents also tell me they are tired of the inflammatory rhetoric coming out of Washington, and I agree. Some members appear to be more interested in making wild allegations for political purposes and in finding solutions to the challenges we face. Let me give you an example. On September 8th, the Chairman issued a staff report claiming the Recovery Act was a failure because it, quote, destroyed or forestalled one million private sector jobs. To support this conclusion, the report cited only a single study issued in May. That study was quickly discredited for its flawed methodology. Nobel laureate Paul Krugman called the underlying study, quote, weak and dubious, unquote. And he warned that it was being, quote, seized on by people who have no idea what the issues are, end of quote. In contra contrast, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office estimated in his most recent report that the Recovery Act, quote, increased the number of people employed by, by between 1 million and 2.9 million, end of quote, end quote, increased the number of full-time equivalent jobs by 1.4 million to 4 million. Other mainstream economists agree with the CBO. A second example of this false rhetoric is the title of today's hearing, How Obama's Green Energy Agenda is Killing Jobs. I guess that is President Obama. Despite this rhetoric, there is no evidence that the Administration's clean energy programs are resulting in fewer jobs. In fact, just the opposite. Developing clean energy technologies is critical to our economic survival, and our competitors know this. China is making massive investments in clean energy programs and dominating these sectors. America is losing its edge in the global marketplace, and we will lose the future ownership of these technologies and the jobs they create if we fail to support these sectors. As a third example, the Chairman appeared on national television this week and accused specific members of Congress of crony capitalism for supporting green initiatives in their districts. 
He called this, and I quote, corruption, end of quote. And he claimed that it was, quote, endemic. He also said this, and I quote, there has been this attitude that somehow government can weigh in with loan guarantees and money and pick winners, specific company winners and losers, end of quote. But just last year, in 2010, the chairman wrote personally to the Secretary of Energy seeking a loan guarantee for an electric vehicle company in San Diego. He not only supported one company, but he endorsed the entire concept of green energy. And he said this, he said this loan would help in, quote, shifting away from fossil fuels and using viable renewable energy sources, end of quote. He said the loan would, quote, reduce dependence on foreign oil, enhance energy security, and promote domestic job creation throughout California as well as in other states, end of quote. Mr. Chairman, in terms of this loan program, it seems like you were for it before you were against it. And according to this morning's press reports, 10 other members on your side wrote similar letters, and I have no problem, I have absolutely no problem with these letters or your praise for the program. But I disagree with the claim that members who support green energy are somehow corrupt. My basic point is this. If we are going to compete with China in the decades to come, we need to be responsible and serious in, those, in our efforts. We need, to, we need to do what my constituents and your constituents and the majority of Americans elected us to do. We need to focus on creating jobs, boosting the economy, and serving the interests of the American citizens. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. As a point of personal privilege, I would ask unanimous consent that the article by a division of the New York Times put into and for the purposes of your opening statement written before it was published at 10 o'clock last night be placed in the record. In that statement, it do, in that article, it does, in fact, state 10 members targeted to say that if we ask for money already in the pipeline to be considered for various projects, that somehow we support it. I am a supporter of, of green and high, or of electric and hybrid vehicles. Uh, and have no problem at all with trying to have vehicles that use more efficient electricity, whether it is from nuclear or other zero emissions. Having said that, uh, I would object to the gentleman's the, you may. Your opening statement was clearly written in anticipation of an article not yet published, and we all know it here. Additionally, I would ask unanimous consent that the majority oversight reform staff report entitled How and I'll have it edited. President Obama's green energy uh, agenda is killing jobs. The actual, without objection, so ordered. The actual reason for this hearing today, which is in fact to find the connection between green expenditures and jobs. However, if the gentleman would like to research any of those projects, we certainly would consider hearings on that. Members will have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. The Chair now recognizes uh, our first panel of witnesses, the Honorable Hilda Solis, a longtime classmate and, uh, and fellow Californians, the Secretary of Labor. Uh, Mr. Daniel Bonneman is what? Poneman, I'm sorry. She's trying to help me as we go along. Poneman, thank you, uh, who is Deputy Secretary of Energy. Thank you for being here. And Mr. Keith Hall is Commissioner of the Bureau of Labor Statistics at the Department of Labor. Pursuant to the committee's rules, all witnesses are to be sworn. Would you please rise to take the oath and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Madam Secretary, you have been on this side of the dais, <laughs> so I will only say it for the other two. Your entire opening statements will be placed in the record, the, uh, the five minutes, fairly close with the usual green, yellow, and red, is designed for you to expand on that as you see fit. I understand that sometimes you are restricted to the words that have been cleared, but to the greatest extent possible, we would like you to use the time to go beyond the written, written statements which are in the record. Madam Secretary. 
Thank you, Chairman, and good morning, and Ranking Member Cummings and the other members of this uh, committee. Um, I want to thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you about the Department of Labor's efforts to help state and local governments and businesses, community colleges, nonprofit groups, and workforce agencies provide training to prepare America's workers to succeed in the clean energy economy of the 21st century. The authors of a recent report by the Brookings Institution estimates that 2.7 million Americans are employed in positions related to the clean economy, and that 90 percent of these jobs are located in traditional industry sectors such as manufacturing and exports. The Recovery Act was an unprecedented investment in the green economy. Our Recovery Act investments, I believe, were wise decisions. The green economy is growing significantly faster than the national economy and therefore we believe can provide a path to a more successful recovery. The vibrancy of the green economy is not artificially propped up by Recovery Act investments. In fact, the Recovery Act investments supply simply supported the investment that private sector corporations have already made that they deem wise. Venture capitalists are voting with their dollars in favor of the future of the green economy, according to the Brookings Institution report. As part of the Recovery Act, the Department of Labor awarded $500 million in competitive grants to fund 189 green job projects throughout the country. Our grants have several important objectives. We have aligned our grants closely with the local and regional labor markets needs by requiring our grantees to partner with local businesses that place a high value on innovation. We also are targeting our grants to serve Americans in most need of help, like veterans, disabled veterans, unemployed workers with disabilities, and workers in areas of high poverty. Our grants give these populations a chance at a secure, well-paying job in the future economy as well as now. For example, in Indiana, a partnership that included the Workforce Development, Natural Resources and Transportation Departments, and the National Guard provided 2,000 young people with green jobs through the Recovery Act funding. We're starting to see some good results from our Recovery Act investments. And as of June uh, 2011, over 52,000 people have participated in our green training grant programs. We expect to eventually serve about 100,000. And about 60 percent of those participants were unemployed when they started training. The rest had jobs, they're known as incumbent workers, but needed training to ensure that they could keep their jobs. To date, well over 26,000 participants have completed their training, and more than half of them who didn't have a job when they started training now do. As these grants progress, we know that these numbers will increase. These results are consistent with the data that shows the green economy in general. And according to Brookings, wages in the green economy are 13 percent higher and provide these good wages to workers, in many cases with lower skills. In fact, according to Brookings, almost half of all green jobs are held by workers with a high school degree or less, yet they are more likely to make good wages or better wages than other low-skilled workers. For the most part, there are no low-wage jobs in the green economy. Our efforts didn't end with the Recovery Act, however. Our Green Jobs Innovation Fund program is building on the success of our Recovery Act programs. We just awarded six grants totaling $38 million. One of those grants went to Jobs for the Future, which is serving over 1,000 unemployed and lower-skilled workers in seven cities. The innovative program views both workers and employers as equal partners in expanding the Green Jobs pipeline. Serving today's youth is critical to our green jobs effort because they're suffering, uh, especially our youth, unprecedented uh, high numbers of unemployment. And I'm especially proud to work with the Office of Apprenticeship, which has uh, worked with employers to identify several new occupations for a very important program known as wind turbine technician, energy auditors, and well drilling operators. And with us today in the audience are Scott Grant and Charlie Kaufman and Jerry Robinson, who are local D.C. area employers that partner with the Department of Labor to provide green apprenticeships. Our DOL Youth Build program is also training young people for the growth industries of the future, such as in green construction. For example, at Casa Verde Youth Build in Austin, Texas, youth are, are being trained to install solar panels, and youth are also building energy efficient and affordable homes in East Austin. In the audience today, we have Eric Rodriguez and Cornelia Stark, who are learning green building techniques through our Youth Build program located here in Washington, D.C. 
Our Job Corps program has trained more than 15,000 students over the past few years in green training jobs. For example, at Clearfield Job uh, Corps Center in Utah, 14 students graduated in our green training program, and they all found jobs. The Department is upholding the Administration's commitment to accountability, transparency in the programs. We continuously monitor our green investments to make sure that they are achieving all of their objectives. But I would like to underscore, because I know my time is running out, is that we do everything we can to help provide better monitoring tools. And we do that on a regular basis. And if we do find that there are issues or problems, then we will assign uh, staff at the national level and regional uh, level to oversee to make sure that we get on course. But keep in mind, these partnerships are driven by business, industry, by data that is generated from uh, the local regional area. So it isn't driven down by the Federal Government. It actually is, is coming up from the bottom uh, where we find that there is a need to fill jobs. There is a lack of training or skilled, but it is all uh, market driven. So with that, um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Sec Secretary Poneman. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, Distinguished Thank Members. You see, Hilda already knows how to hit that button. She is a real pro, but she will show you if you have any problems. I, I am always learning from my distinguished colleagues. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and Distinguished Members of the Committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Department of Energy's programs to strengthen our energy security, to advance clean energy innovation, to create jobs for the American people, and to make the U.S. more competitive in the global economy. Since, unlike Secretary Solis, I am not yet known to the Committee, I will uh, allow myself a brief introduction. I have spent over 35 years working in the national security uh, arena, including uh, six years working for President George Herbert Walker Bush uh, and President Bill Clinton at the National Security Council. I spent a number of years in the private sector as well before returning to public service in 2009 at the Department of Energy. Worldwide, between five and ten trillion dollars are spent on energy every year. This is an enormous market that is expected to increase dramatically in the coming years and as developing countries like China and India continue to grow. Countries around the world are already moving aggressively to develop and deploy the clean energy technologies that will be needed to meet the glow growing global demand. Just last year, global clean energy investments reached $243 billion, an increase of 50 percent from 2009, and the pace of growth shows no sign of slowing. There is a significant economic and employment opportunity to be seized by the companies and the countries that successfully innovate and compete in these clean energy industries. This is a race. It is a race to develop the technologies and the domestic manufacturing capacity that will drive job creation and set a foundation for the future prosperity of the United States. Our competitors are stepping up and they are playing to win. The United States once led the world in clean energy investments. Now we rank third behind China and Germany. So we have a choice to make today. We can compete in the global marketplace, creating American jobs and selling American products, or we can resign ourselves to importing the technologies of tomorrow from abroad. I believe that we can and must compete. That is why, under President Obama's leadership, we have taken unprecedented steps to deploy American innovation and to make sure that the U.S. is a leader in the global energy economy of the future. Through our investments in clean energy, we are creating hundreds of thousands of new clean energy jobs and catalyzing investments by the private sector while reducing our excessive dependence on energy imports and saving money for families and businesses across the country. This is a race that we can win, but we must recognize that it is not a race that can be won overnight. It is going to take a sustained commitment to build a competitive clean energy industry in America especially as our companies are forced to compete against foreign competitors like China that are providing their companies with significant state support. To meet this challenge, we have focused our investments in three main areas. First, advancing innovation through research and development. Second, expanding American manufacturing capacity. And third, enabling the deployment of innovative clean energy technologies at commercial scale when private financing is not widely available. These efforts will continue to be essential in growing our economy, moving private capital off the sidelines, and expanding new industries in the United States. And they have helped to put hundreds of thousands of Americans back to work. 
even as we face difficult budget choices, the government can and should continue to play a role in supporting American companies and helping them to compete globally. American jobs today and in the decades to come depend on it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Dr. Hall, you are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am pleased to be here today to provide a summary of activities underway in the Bureau of Labor Statistics to measure employment and green jobs. BLS is, as you know, an independent statistical agency that is the principal Federal source for information on employment and unemployment, inflation, wages and benefits, worker safety and productivity. Our mission is to provide relevant, accurate, timely and objective statistical data to help inform policymakers and the public. All of our data products, including the upcoming green jobs data, meet these high standards. To protect our impartiality and independence, we take no role in policymaking and do not conduct policy analysis ourselves. BLS received funding beginning in the fiscal year 2010 to develop and implement the collection of new data on green jobs. The goal of the BLS Green Jobs Initiative is to develop information on the number of and trend over time in green jobs, the industrial, occupational and geographic distribution of the jobs, and the wages of workers in these jobs. To measure green jobs, BLS first had to develop an objective, measurable de definition. BLS began by reviewing work done by other national statistical agencies, such as Statistics Canada and Eurostat, as well as work done by various State labor market information offices and by nonprofit organizations. Looking at these studies, BLS found the common thread running through the various definitions is that green jobs help to preserve or restore the environment or conserve national, natural resources. BLS engaged in an extensive outreach and consultation with other Federal agencies with expertise in various aspects of the jobs and then published a draft green jobs definition in a March 2010 Federal Register notice. BLS received about 150 comments on the, this proposed definition, as well as additional feedback from Federal stakeholders, including the Departments of Energy, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, and the Council on Environmental Quality, and an interagency discussion organized by the Office of Management and Budget in April 2010. In, in a September 21, 2010 Federal Register notice, BLS announced its final definition of green jobs for the purposes of statistical data collection. Under this definition, there are two different types of jobs that qualify as green jobs. First are jobs in business establishments that produce goods or services that benefit the environment or conserve national, natural resources. BLS refers to these as green goods and services jobs. The second is jobs in which the work performed makes the production process of business establishments more environmentally friendly or use fewer natural resources. BLS refers to these as green technologies and practices jobs. The first step for BLS in measuring green jobs and services was to identify sectors and industries within which goods and services that directly benefit the environment are produced. In total, BLS identified over 300 detailed industries as well as as defined by the North American Industry Classification System, where green goods and services are produced. Some examples are the utilities sector, which produces electricity from renewable resources, the manufacturing sector, which produces Energy Star certified appliances, the agriculture sector, which produces organic crops, the construction sector, which provides weatherization services, and the professional and business services sector, which provides an environmental consulting services. The next step for BLS currently underway is to conduct the Green Goods and, uh, and Services Survey to identify the proportion of each industry that is engaged in producing green goods and services. This survey was sent out in May of 2011 to a sample of 120,000 business establishments in the industries identified as producing green goods and services. The survey presents these businesses establishments with a description of green products or services classified in their respective industries and asks respondents to establish, estimate the share of establishment revenue accounted for by green outputs. Based on the survey, BLS will produce data on green goods and services employment for the U.S. by industry and four states by industry sector. The first estimates will be available in early 2012. To measure green technologies and practices jobs, BLS is conducting a special employer data survey collection called the Green Technologies and Practices Survey. Businesses in any industry that may use green technologies and practices, regardless of the nature or greenness of their outputs, are, 
are, are, are potentially included. Therefore, the Green Technologies and Practices Survey will be sent to a sample of about 35,000 business establishments selected from all U.S. industry sectors. Respondents will again be presented with descriptions of various types of technologies and practices that benefit the environment or conserve resources and asked to indicate which any, uh, if which any of they are utilized by the establishment. We should have uh, estimates on that survey by mid-2012. Thank you. Appreciate that. I will now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Poneman, uh, starting with you, would you consider hydroelectricity as a renewable energy source? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, we have a continuous flow of uh, uh, water, and uh, uh, absolutely it uh, keeps flowing. W would you consider so? Would that fit potentially the definition of what a green job would be, or be in that category of green jobs? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, defer to my distinguished colleague, who has uh, done more etymological study of, of how we define green job. But certainly, in terms of low carbon renewable resource, hydroelectric fits right in the pocket. And would that fit your, uh, Dr. Hall, would that fit your definition? Uh, yes, it would. Uh, oops, sorry. Yes, it would. Uh, one, one of our categories of green, green goods is energy from renewable resources. And you would consider hydroelectric uh, hydro power, power as power. renewable? Yes. Uh, and Madam Secretary, would you consider hydroelectricity as renewable? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, one of the frustrations and questions is this idea that it's created, as you said, uh, Dr. Er, Mr. Poneman, quote, hundreds of thousands of new jobs, end quote. I have a difficult time seeing that. Um, a, we don't have a definition of what that is. So how do we come to this conclusion? I, I ask that rhetorically as a follow-up. But I think one of the difficulties, at least you see from, from myself, is this claim, this exorbitant claim of hundreds of thousands of jobs, yet there is not even a definition of what those jobs are going to be. If we had the Department of Interior here, they would take great exception to the idea that hydroelectricity is renewable. Now, to me, it's, I, I, conclude, I come to the same conclusion as you do. I think it is renewable. But it is one of the challenges, and, and we do need to, to straighten it out. And the, the administration is on very dramatically different pages on this, and it affects the states, particularly out west, who have a lot of these, these resources. Um, Madam Secretary, I, I'd like to go through this, uh, and I'm looking at your written statement here, that, uh, and you picked various items out for your verbal comments. In the Recovery Act, starting on page 3, it said that there were $500 million for competitive grants. And then as you uh, picked out some of the statistics on page 4, paragraph 3, talking about the 52,000 people have participated in the Recovery Act. I want to make sure I'm doing my math right. I'm skipping down to, to the bottom there. It says approximately 15,000 of those individuals did not have jobs upon program entry. Of those individuals without a job when they started the program, 52 percent have found work with 83 percent of those individuals obtaining employment in the same industry occupation in which they were trained. That number, as best I can calculate, comes out to 6,225, 6, and we congratulate and we are happy for them and their families. One of my concerns is if we are spending $500 million to get people trained and the conclusion is 6,200 people, that is roughly $80,000 per person. Actually, um, if I could respond, Mr. Chairman, what I would uh, want to remind you is that our programs are intended to train individuals, incumbent workers, those that are currently on the job, as well as assisting those that have been unemployed, displaced. So think about the automobile worker who just lost their job, now does not have any uh, ability to find transition into something else similar. So we will uh, track them, get them into programs that will per, uh, precisely for this reason look at new techniques that they could uh, engage in through our training programs. And maybe now we'll be involved in hybrid uh, automobile development. And many have made that transition. So there is that, um, how could I say, uh, ability for individuals to make that transition. And it's a little more clear in other industries. It's a lot harder. I will tell you again, though, our funding is for training. And based on uh, our was, surveys... Was I inaccurate? I'm sorry to interrupt, but was I inaccurate in my numbers and assessment? We're talking about $80,000 per person. I think that's actually a little higher. We look at it more as someone who is enrolling in a community college. The training program typically uh, runs that amount. But of the ones that you can these... actually document that actually went out and found a job, 
It didn't create any jobs. It, it trained them, and you can argue the validity of needing to do we, that. Let, we trained let me go people very to also keep uh, those jobs because many employers were actually laying people off if they didn't have higher credentials because they wanted to remain competitive. So that is a part of our program that we are offering to employers. I have just a few seconds here, but in your written testimony, you talked about a uh, Clearfield Job Corps, wonderful organization based in my state, outside of my district. But what you also, one of the things that's written in your written testimony saying that the 14 students recently graduated from green training programs, including renewable resources, obviously that sounds green, overhead line construction, and advanced automotive. Those don't sound quite as green as maybe we would be led to believe. If you could help me understand why that would be categorized as green, I would appreciate it. My time has expired, and I'll, I'll yield back. Uh, and actually now uh, recognize uh, the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Were well, you going to answer that question, Mr. Hall, the question you just asked? Uh, so could somebody answer that question? I think it's a good question. I would say that uh, many of our training programs uh, provide a variety of services. So while not all these programs received uh, uh, how could I say, more than 50 percent of the monies that they get is not all uh, dedicated to just a green. What is happening, though, all our programs, Youth Build and Job Corps, have been told to change their curriculum. So we have students that are enrolled in programs to be, say, automobile mechanics or diesel mechanics, and they are learning new technology. In many cases, they are using new refined fuels things of that nature. So, yes, they are learning some of that new aptitude, uh, but across the board, I would say many of the programs continue to provide some somewhat traditional training. But we are emphasizing, and keep in mind, we have only had this program in place now for less than two and a half years. So we are making that transition, and we want to do better, and we want to make sure that our, our young people especially get that upgraded skill set that they are going to need to make them more competitive. Thank you. We will now recognize the gentleman from Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, um, are we training people to get into careers? Uh, is that part of it? I'm, I'm just curious, because uh, I know there are people in my district that, that were able to take advantage of some training programs so that they established a career, so that they weren't laid off, and, and maybe they were in a job, and that job, uh, in other words, in this economy, we are having a lot of employers who have learned to do more with less people. And could you just comment very briefly, because I have a number of questions. Mr. Cummings, what, Congressman Cummings, is what we see is that many of our students, for example, those that are here today in the Job Corps and Youth Bill program, receive several different credentials and certificates. So they are being trained for a career and a profession as opposed to just one job as someone who, say, is just a bricklayer. They are actually taught different kinds of uh, sec uh, segments of the construction industry, which includes renewable. And also uh, electricity, you get a whole set of different credentials that you can earn while you're in that program. Now, on July 13, the Brookings Institution issued a major study providing the first comprehensive analysis of the U.S. green economy. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to put the Brookings report into the record. Uh, without objection. Thank you. This report made a number of findings, and I would like to focus on two. First, the report found that the clean economy generates good playing jobs. According to the report, the clean economy employs some 2.7 million workers more than the fossil fuel industry. The report also goes on to say newer clean tech segments produce explosive job gains, and the clean economy outperformed the nation uh, during the recession. Newer clean economy uh, establishments, especially those in young energy-related segments such as wind energy, solar, and smart grid added jobs at a Detroit pace, albeit from small bases. Madam Secretary, do you agree with the Brookings report that certain segments of the clean economy offer the potential for explosive job growth, and do the other panelists agree? And I want to go back to what the Chairman was saying, and, uh, and it was implied by Congressman Chavis, too, that your numbers are inaccurate, I, and I, I, need, I need you to address that. Am I, is that a fair statement? I think it's very fair to oh, say fine. that we think it's completely okay, no, just, fuzzy I numbers. Sure, I want to make sure that they address that, because you've been accused of something here, and I want you to clear it up, because I think that's going to be part of the basis of this hearing and what those folks over there are writing about. Right. Uh, Congressman, I want to reiterate that uh, through our Recovery Act programs, our job training programs, we've, we have already trained 52,000. The initial grants are, are and that's a uh, fact. 
Yes. Okay. And uh, we potentially, in the next coming year and a half, possibly, we will see up to 96,000 that will be targeted, so they will go through our credential programs. At this point in time, as of 6.30, uh, 6, uh, meaning the month, 6.30, 11, uh, 26,000 workers have completed training and about 15,000 who were unemployed workers and 11,000 who were what we call incumbent workers. So they had jobs but were being trained in our programs as well. And over 22,000 have received a credential. And I would say that approximately half of that uh, 15,000 or so did get new jobs. And we're tracking that as we continually roll along here. And what we're finding is the average cost to provide the training averages, again, about the cost it would be to attend a community college. The Brookings report also made a second key point, which is that the United States needs to support these key sectors to remain competitive. Here is what the report says. China now leads the world in clean economy uh, deployment. Uh, in 2010, China put into place a staggering $54.4 billion in clean energy investments. By contrast, the United States' private investment in clean energy total $34 billion. Now the gap is widening further. Uh, the Brookings report also says, says this. China, which now produces half of the world's wind turbine and solar modules, recently announced it would accelerate its clean revolution over the next five years and has set out uh, uh, aggressive growth plans for strategic emerging industrial critical uh, industries critical to economic restructuring including multiple new energy categories, electric vehicles, and energy efficiency products. Do you have a comment on that? Mr. Cummings, I would just say that you can't compare $54 billion of investments from China as opposed to $500 million that I had for the first time in the Recovery Act. And my role is to provide training and skill assistance. It's not to find the job. That's why venture capitalists, that's why corporations, that's why business individuals make those decisions. They're actually making the risk to, to increase our capacity to go in the green sector. And I would say that, just to remind folks, back in 2007, George Bush signed into law the Green Job Jobs Act program. He believed in it as well, as well as many people that have been invested in this area for now for more than a decade. And I would just say that it's something that we are obviously needing more assistance, more support, and if we could compete with our friends in other countries, I think in the future it will bode very well for us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Now recognize myself. Madam Secretary, I'm going to be brief. It is only $500 million, which in Washington is small dollars. Our point, I think, accurately, Mr. Chaffetz made it well, and I am just going to summarize it. You spent $500 million. You spent a lot of it on people who already had jobs. Of the people who didn't have jobs, you have got about 6,000 who got jobs, at least as of today. And those jobs include people who are basically just working on modern diesel trucks and other things which are no, no, you said it yourself in your own testimony. It's broad training. So the statistics of the 6,200 or so who actually got jobs, who didn't have jobs, can well be on the periphery of what most people would consider to be green jobs. As a matter of fact, if they left that training and came to work for Mr. Cummings and they're here on the hearing today, they probably will end up being counted as green jobs, which means I go to Dr. Hall. Dr. Hall, you've got the big bucks. Was Solyndra and their 1,000 jobs counted in your assessment? I mean, until they went bankrupt and laid everyone right. off? No, that's a yes or no, if you don't mind. Oh, okay. I, I don't know. Okay. That, that's the third answer, and it's always a good one if you don't. Your counting of these jobs, though, clearly includes people who are not, in fact, designing and building solar can panels or doing other things which are truly green energy production, correct? It goes well beyond green energy production. Your figures include people who are working in the environmental, how to, how to be kinder to the environment. That is in, in the written proof we have here, correct? Yeah, yeah, one of our categories that we are collecting data is environmental compliance, education and training and public awareness. Okay. So as the government creates a, just a chat par, pot more bureaucracy that forces more people to have to do more EPA compliance and studies and, and, and wasteful sometimes restudying, that all counts as green, right? So if the government simply infinitely burdens business so they have to get a whole bunch more people to do a lot more studying to keep the government happy, that counts as green jobs, correct? Well, one of our surveys is the, is the green technology uh, and practices surveys. We are looking at, at okay. establishments. Right. But we are looking, for, we're looking so. at the accuracy of your numbers here today. 
We already have the proof that it costs a fortune to get very few jobs. Now we look at those jobs and find out that those jobs are broadly defined so that you have got a lot less real jobs created than even the pitiful numbers that it is showing. Now, when people want to tell me there is 2.5 million, one of the problems is, yes, you get more money for working in green subsidized industry. You get more money, then there are more people. But you know, the cost of producing energy by, from solar electrics is so inefficient and expensive that you subsidize the production, you subsidize the development, and then you subsidize the use. So what a surprise. You can afford to pay 13 percent more. Let me, uh, let me just ask Mr. Poneman, or Secretary Poneman, because you are the closest thing to somebody who has been in private practice here, private enterprise. China is doing all the things Mr. Cummings said, but they are not using green energy to do it. They are building more coal plants and buying more American coal than any other customer. The number one exporter of coal to China is us. The number one importer of coal in the world is China from us. So they are building windmills so we can subsidize them and buy them. They are building solar panels so we can subsidize and buy them. They are using low-cost energy to be comp more competitive in selling us high-cost energy. Isn't that basically the model, at least as of today? I would not presume to speak for the Chinese model, uh, Mr. Chairman. But, for well, but, but you do know it is not a secret. They are using coal, fire, and nuclear to produce all that green stuff. They are not using solar panels to make solar panels. They are, they are now the world's leading producer of solar panels and Producer, servants. seller, and exporter, correct? Uh, as far as I know, sir. So okay. So they are a great manufacturing nation. They are the right. number one manufacturing nation in the world. They took that from us while we were diddling around having higher cost of energy and bragging about the fact that if you have an inefficient form of energy rising, such as solar panels for pure energy, there are some places in which solar panels make a lot of sense. But in fact, as a mainstream energy source, what we are doing is raising the cost of our energy while China has become the world's greatest manufacturer out from underneath us. I can speak to the U.S. side. What we are doing, Mr. Chairman, is we believe we can re reverse that trend. You are going to reverse it with higher cost energy? No, no. We are going to, re we're going to reverse it with uh, innovation, with uh, the financial markets we have, with the best entrepreneurs in the world, and we are in the process of doing it, sir. It is amazing to me that you would say the financial markets. Mr. Cummings would probably be, be rather upset if you said our great financial markets after the hearings we have held since 2008. My time is expiring. This hearing is about the accounting for jobs. And hopefully as we go through this, both sides will focus on the jobs that are in fact not created or in fact are only created through subsidies. With that, I recognize the gentlelady from the if, District of if, Columbia. Might morning. I just respond to the, the last comment? Uh, no, there Mr. wasn't Chairman. a question. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Norton. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, and this is about the accounting for jobs. And you know this is a very important subject because is the, this is the next iteration of the world economy. You don't get anywhere if you have already drawn your conclusions with a title that says how Obama's green jobs agenda is killing jobs. We want to know. Uh, we, we want to find out the answers. This supposed to be an investigative co committee. Um, when it comes to government investment and innovation, uh, let's not pretend that, that, that that's new. That's uh, as old as uh, the American economy. Um, uh, the rail was laid before there were trains and people enough to go there because of government investment. Uh, so that's something we have done, uh, laid to your part of the country, Mr. Chairman, when there were very few people out there like yourself. Um, you say in your testimony at page 3, there are certain things that the private sector cannot reasonably be expected to do in a market economy, including undertaking investments uh, in clean energy, et cetera, pri that, that primarily confer uh, national benefits beyond the return to shareholders. That was the case with the rail industry. That obviously is the case with this new uh, technology. The old industrial economy has, 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 is now limited in its growth. So let's, let's look, since, since many in this committee already know the answer, uh, let's look to a genuine investigation. The Economic Policy Institute issued its report uh, that concluded that the Recovery Act's investments 
at approximately $93 billion through the end of 2010, boosted uh, overall GDP by $146 billion and created nearly 1 million uh, jobs. Uh, now, you know, I recognize that China is a command economy. We are a market economy. Uh, and when we invest, it's a little more difficult than when, when they do. Uh, but they are underwriting billions of dollars in green uh, technologies, uh, trying to get out of the old coal economy that they are using uh, because they have nothing else they can use. Is, is China... Uh, also killing jobs uh, by making such massive in investments? Or are they cornering the market in these new clean technologies? Uh, Mr. Poneman? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for, for the question. Uh, it's a, a great danger that uh, this uh, great race that we are embarking on to build the energy of the future will not be built in America. What the investments we are trying to make are doing are trying to reverse that trend. In 1996, we produced 43 percent of the world's solar panels. We now produce 6 percent. Uh, we can reverse that with the kind of smart investments that we are trying to make uh, under the Recovery Act and under the authorities that have been granted by this, this Congress. I want to be clear for the record that China is, in fact, using domestic uh, solar as well as all the coal and nuclear. The fact of the matter is they are uh, using tremendous amounts of all kinds of energy, and I think it would be a tragedy if we were to cede the playing field to our foreign competition in building the jobs for the future that should be here in America. Yeah, precisely because these are new and shareholders want to see a return on their investment. Uh, private uh, pr private uh, industry has never gone whole hog and, and leading the country. It's been the other way around. What's the experience of other governments uh, around the world in, in pursuing the green jobs agenda? Are they trying to corner the market as well and get ahead of us? The, the uh, governments that have been most uh, active, uh, Congressman, uh, are the uh, governments putting the largest dollar investments in. We have now slipped to third place in the world. Uh, we lost a place in just a year. We have been behind China. Now Germany has surged ahead of us. We can reverse this, but we are going to have to be really uh, focused on, on uh, moving capital into these new clean uh, energy technologies. Uh, do, do, can, can either of you uh, uh, say that uh, what, you have, what you have seen of green jobs has done more to kill it than to make or, or, or uh, encourage uh, green jobs in our country. Um, Madam uh, Congresswoman, um, I would just say on my, on, on my visits around the country, I have actually seen job growth and in areas where I have seen depressed and blighted communities come back to life because now there are solar panel institute, uh, you know, organizations that are actually compiling these kinds of materials and actually making production and creating jobs in areas that have been blighted. Not just that, but also in lithium batteries and also in other new hybrid vehicles. Even our automobile industry has been renewed. We have more jobs now in that area and a potential for more cars that are going to be fuel efficient. So I do see that happening. But we can't compete with China and others when government state-owned uh, funds are being used and you're looking at small portions being utilized for training. And just to go back to a statement that the chairman said, our funding runs in cycles. So you can't produce a great number of uh, job training participants in a matter of one year. It takes a cycle. You have to genie up six months, then you get people into the training, the, the curriculum, you get the location, and these grants run anywhere from two to three years. So we're barely in the midpoint of our cycle. We expect to go up to 96,000 participants. We now recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Burkle, for her questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for calling this very important hearing, and thank you to our panelists this morning uh, for being here. Um, I just want to take exception. The chairman was um, this line of questioning on coal, and I think it's slightly disingenuous for you all to sit there and compare China uh, as being the, the standard bearer for alternative energy and, and production of solar panels when, in fact, we have had people here from the coal industry and we have heard firsthand the obstacles that are being put in their way for the production of coal. So, we can't compare apples to oranges. We in this country are impeding the use of coal production and the use of coal. And in China, they don't have those standards. Those impediments are not put in the way of, of, of them and the use of coal. And they're using it then to produce these, these solar panels, which 
they can produce much more cheaply, as we have seen in the Solyndra. So th that is just a comment I wanted to make. I think it is very important to acknowledge, number one, um, when we talk about the fact that, that China and these other governments are infusing money into the industry, this is the United States of America. And we let the free market rule. It isn't a question of what the government can prop up. And I think that's a real important distinction we should make here this morning. Um, now I'll get to my questions. Thank you. Um, Secretary Solis, can you just give me your definition of, of a green job? Well, I, I believe that uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics outlined what we have been using as a guide. Uh, for for our program, so we look at we look at opportunities where we can uh, define uh, through legislation what has been used typically as a green job. So something that conserves energy and also can recycle and also a renew a renewable energy, something that is new that is going to uh, reduce our our savings in terms of of our efficiencies there. So we use that. We use what the BLS and what other data is out there. And typically, we have also used uh, what the Workforce Investment Act uh, research guidelines have provided us even before we began to take on this, this role of defining uh, what uh, green jobs are. Do you have one specific definition of a green job? I would say that uh, what we look at in terms of, of uh, of our definition is what exactly what the Bureau of Labor Statistics has outlined. So it's, it's very large, we know it's broad, and we know that there are different sectors across the board that are impacted. So yeah, you could have a business that's involved in providing maybe renewable energy, but you also have accountants and other individuals, financial folk that are also a part of that industry. Thank you. Um, I want to just get into um, some of your testimony and what you've talked about here today the certificates or the credentialing that's given to a student who, who um, completes the program. How long is the program? The programs vary. We have programs that uh, can run in length from, say, uh, six weeks, six months to one year, depending on the kind of credential that you're seeking. And in many cases, for example, we have students here in the Job Corps program. They're in, enrolled typically in the program anywhere from one year to two years. During that time frame, they can select which certificates they would like to be in, uh, enrolled in to obtain that particular degree or certificate. And that certificate or that credential, is it recognized in the industry? Is it recognized by unions? Yes. Is it yes. Who recognizes it and what there is are, it called? There are standards that are established and we go by what has already been uh, established established through our, our department. And typically uh, in the apprenticeship program, for example, we have new definitions, new criteria that's actually being set up that I believe the BLS uh, could probably elaborate a little bit more on in terms of looking into new industries like wind power, uh, solar, and, and, and other areas that uh, are now becoming more of our vocabulary. Um, I also want to follow up with some of your testimony with regards to the wages that a green trainee is paid versus a regular trainee, can you just what what is the the starting wage for a green trainee? It depends. Um, you could have someone who's working, say, at uh, minimum wage, um, and typically uh, move up because of certificates, say, in uh, uh, LED uh, lead lighting and and what have you. Those are those are I think one of the highest standards right now. If you can get those certificates, you actually will make uh, a lot more money. And, and those salaries are, are obviously a lot higher than minimum wage. Do you know what the average starting salary is for one of these uh, green trainees? It, it, depends on, it depends on what field you go in. Weatherization could be very different from someone who is also doing, say, uh, installation of solar power panels and also re-metering someone's home, in, uh, putting them into a new electricity grid system. But I would tell you that overall, and according to the Brookings, Findings that I that I referred to that the salaries are anywhere from say ten to thirteen percent higher. Thank you. I see I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank I thank you. the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We now recognize the gentleman from Cleveland, Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to address my questions to uh, Mr. Poneman, and uh, because they also may, may relate to. Uh, some information that Secretary Solis has, if you would like to uh, join in, you can tell me. Uh, the, the main purpose of this committee is to be able to get the facts, and I just want to make sure I have my facts correct here. The loan guarantee to Solyndra was approved under a Bush administration program 
the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Is that, is that correct? Yes, sir. Do you know that? Okay, Mr. Poneman. Now, according to the September 14 testimony of Jonathan Silver, who is the current head of the Department of Energy's Loan Guarantee Program, one, the Solyndra application was filed with the Bush administration in 2006. Two, two years of extensive uh, uh, due diligence had been done by the Bush administration before President Obama took office. And three, before President Obama took office in late January of 2009, the Bush administration had already set a timeline of March of 2009 for issuing a conditional loan guarantee uh, commitment to Solyndra. Is that is this factual so far? I was not here yet, but that is my understanding, sir, yes. Okay. And when the Department of Energy conditionally approved the Solyndra loan guarantee in March of 2009, it was doing so under a schedule established by the Bush administration. Is that correct? That is my understanding. And when Solyndra met those conditions, it was the closing of the deal that occurred in September of 2009, the closing of the conditional loan guarantee commitment that had been scheduled by the Bush administration. They scheduled it for March of 2009 for the closing. Well, my understanding, uh, Congressman, is that the Credit Committee remanded uh, the project for more work and that they expected that more work would uh, produce the answers that were then reviewed in March. Thank you. Now, the Department of Energy has approved dozens of other loan guarantees under this program. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And there is another solar energy company, First Solar, that has received a number of those loan guarantees. Is that correct? We are in the process of conditional commitments moving to financial close. First Solar has been uh, in that pool, and I don't know which of the applications have gone to final close and which are conditional. But, but in fact, the loan guarantees that First Solar has received or is expected to receive by the September 30th deadline uh, uh, to uh, total approximately 10 times the amount that was guaranteed for Solyndra. Is that correct? I would have to check and get the precise numbers for you, but that is easily done. Well, would you get those for the members of the committee? Absolutely. Because according to a September 19th article in the Bloomberg News Service, First Solar, a company based in Tempe, Arizona, has, quote, achieved record efficiency for a thin film solar cell and will incorporate the advance into its manufacturing technology next quarter to outpace cost reductions by Chinese rivals and compete against fossil fuels without government aid, unquote. Uh, it seems to me this would be consistent with what the Bush Administration Energy Policy Act of 2005 was intended to accomplish. Do you have any comment on that? Well, I would just say, sir, that scale is incredibly important in driving down solar panel prices. And, and so to the extent that they can build out at a much larger scale, it would have the tendency to drive down those prices and improve our competitiveness, yes? Yeah, my staff just handled, handed me uh, some uh, facts here about the uh, uh, first solar loan guarantees amount, uh, loan guarantee amounts. Um, and I have First uh, Solar Inc., uh, uh, 680 million. First Solar Inc., uh, this is called Desert Sunlight, uh, 1.8 billion. Uh, First Solar Inc., Topaz, uh, Solar Generation, 1.9 billion. Just want to make sure that we, we understand that while the rest of the world looks to the future and, and prepares for it by ramping up dramatically its green sector, uh, we are busy holding hearings like this. Um, which, which end up uh, impugning the President at the expense of the economy. Now, anyone who has uh, uh, listened to me for more than 15 seconds knows that I am uh, probably the last Democrat who is an apologist for this administration. Uh, but this thing is really about our economy and this is about need, this is about the urgency, and that should command our attention here above all else. And I think that uh, I think we actually have bipartisan support. Uh, judging from the record for green energy programs. That is the part of the path to the future to move the American economy. So as we move through this hearing, I hope that we can summon the same kind of energy to focus on how we can get, create millions of jobs with green and uh, green uh, wind, solar, microtechnologies, put America back to work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. We now go to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, appreciate the opportunity to ask the questions. And I, I just can't let the statement that was uh, put out earlier that we can never count on private sector manufacturing to lead the way. 
uh, in, in technology and growth. I, I just, that, that is just unbelievable uh, in a country that has had the uh, agricultural, industrial revolution, technological revolution here, and that did not come from government. Henry Ford in Michigan, down the road from me in my district, didn't produce the assembly line with the government mandating that or even giving special money for it at the time. So uh, that is frustrating to hear, Mr. Chairman, uh, as we talk about this green jobs. Um, I would like to uh, do a follow-up question to uh, Commissioner Hall. Um, do you count blue-collar jobs? Sure. We, we don't make any distinction between what kind of job. We, we, we count, you we, don't we, count white-collar jobs, then? Yeah, we, we count all the jobs. If, if an establishment is producing a green output, a green good or service, we count all the jobs in that establishment. So then, as we talk about green-collar jobs today, what, you know, what's the point of counting green jobs or even making that metric? Why are we giving official legitimacy to such a dubious metric? Well, uh, we do make an effort. Uh, we do make an effort in our second survey, our Green Technology and Practices Survey. To, we're also there trying to count jobs. People have jobs whose, whose main job is to uh, um, is green, so they have a green. Well, you know, we, we will capture some of that. <laughs> we may capture that, but it seems to me we want jobs, uh, and, and, and an attentiveness to green uh, seems to be frustrating some of that. Let me let me. Uh, uh, let me ask uh, uh, Secretary Solis, uh, and thank you for being here, um, how much of the green jobs training money has gone to organized labor since 2009? All of our grants have allowed for union participation. So if we had uh, partnerships with uh, businesses as well as labor, they were also involved in that. So the purpose here is to create the opportunities for the slots, as I said, so that we could train people up. Do we know how much money has gone to I, labor I, I for would, green jobs? Well, I would say that depending, depending on the different programs, because not all of them uh, were just exclusively labor. I mean, that's, that's not a number that I have. Do we know the hand. percentage increased or decreased over time that, of green jobs going to labor? Green job uh, participation uh, comes about because of the partners that apply for the grant. So you could have, for example, IBEW, for example, who did get a grant in partnership with the industry. And uh, if you were to look at who's being trained, they could have been union members that were, were taking advantage and getting upgrades or well, new individuals coming in. But they were working in partnership with the corporate community, the management side of it, that actually provides also for the additional training and skills. So is there any evidence that uh, these particular organizations, uh, labor organizations, have expertise in training people in green jobs? Absolutely. IBW is one of the premier apprenticeship programs uh, and groups that actually provides very, very good credential programs. They've actually have been the leaders even before we gave them funding for these programs. I would love to see the percentage then since 2009 of, of green jobs, sure. training programs going to labor. Where we've had labor participation. Labor participation. They're joint. they're joint. They're not exclusively for labor. They're joint. Do the best you can on that. I appreciate seeing that. Thank you. Um, just had largest contact of information that I've ever had about uh, rare earth, and I, and I, I turn to uh, 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 Mr. Poneman uh, for this. Um, China produces nearly 90 percent of the world's rare earth metals, uh, many of which are used in green technology, such as wind turbines, uh, hybrid car batteries, uh, and so forth. Uh, recent Chinese policies have restricted access to these resources for American companies. How can American green companies obtain these necessary rare earth metals uh, to manufacture the green technologies with that going on? Thank you, Congressman. I just uh, want to make one comment to be clear. I'm not sure what the reference was to, but, but we believe that the free market of the United States of America is the most powerful engine of economic growth the world has yet seen. So I want to make sure we're, we're clear. We think it's a tremendous driver. I appreciate that. Uh, on rare earths, on rare earths, this is a critical problem. Uh, we have uh, we've looked at this deeply, and uh, we have to do a number of things. Number one, we have to see where we can get production up in other places outside of China. Number two, we have to look at things that can be done in the processing of these uh, rare earths, which uh, sometimes have toxic uh, issues, to make sure that we can use our technology to get access to them uh, cleanly and safely. Uh, and third, we have to see if there are ways in which there are 
places where so far they are uh, uh, intrinsic to the product if we need to start finding alternatives to those rare earths. Well, we are losing, we're losing uh, market share. We are losing an opportunity for jobs uh, by delaying this activity when, in fact, we are using them in our products up until China holding us back. Uh, with, uh, with that, my time has expired. I um, appreciate your comments. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You and I both know that the Chinese are watching this hearing. They are probably pleased. What they are seeing is more partisan bickering. Now, we don't know if the Chinese bicker because they make their decisions in private. Um, we are also seeing, I think, a false conflict between fossil fuels and renewable fuels, and that suits certain partisan motivations at this time in our democracy. I think most Americans are for the lowest cost fuel, period including externalities. So far in this hearing, no one's made reference to the fact that you can barely breathe the air in Beijing, China, and other major cities. You can cut it with a knife. I'm from coal country. I love coal. I want it to work. But we've also created a false sense that coal is the unsubsidized fuel. Mr. Chairman, you and I both know that Coal has been subsidized for decades. In my area, clean coal has been subsidized for decades. I wish some of those efforts had been more productive because it's hard to clean up coal. Maybe it's still possible. I haven't given up trying. But we are blessed with vast coal reserves, but it's hard to clean up that fuel. Now, global warming may be more controversial on your side. Most scientists agree that global warming is happening and may even have a man-made cause. So carbon-based fuels, that is an externality. So, Mr. Chairman, as you pointed out in an earlier letter on behalf of a constituent, and I and by no means blame you for those efforts, it's very important that we don't create false conflicts between fuels, and that we make rational decisions about the best way to go. It's been established by testimony here today that the Chinese vastly subsidize renewables more than we do. By five or ten-fold or larger, because we don't really know the Chinese numbers. Now the Germans are subsidizing it more than we are. Now, I would prefer the free market work entirely on its own. That would be great. We in Tennessee are blessed because a company called Hemlock, a private sector American company, a subsidiary of Dow Chemical Company, not a dewy-eyed idealist in this field has located thousands of green jobs in Tennessee, and I hope that Dr. Hall is counting those jobs. Wacker, the leading German producer of solar panels, has also created thousands of green jobs in Tennessee. And no one is ever quite sure why they locate in a state, but perhaps the lack of a state income tax in Tennessee had something to do with it. And those states that want those green jobs, maybe they can have a more efficient state government and attract more more industries. So there are some real opportunities here, Mr. Chairman, to help America have more energy choices, help us pick the lowest cost choices, including the externalities, because nobody wants to live in a polluted, dirty air environment. No one wants to ruin the planet. And experimental technologies take time. They take effort. And I don't know the stats because they're not included in this hearing, but coal may have been one of the most subsidized fuels ever if you look at the decades that we've spent on subsidizing clean coal technology. So let's do our best to try to make rational decisions for the country. Hopefully we can get back on the right path. And I think that, again, one of the worst parts of hearings like this is the Chinese see us fighting. They see the partisanship and they see, hey, maybe state capitalism, their version, is working better than our version. And that should please them. We've got to make sure that democracy works better. And more balanced hearings, I think, can help us do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be delighted to yield to the ranking member. Thank you. Uh, thank the gentleman for his statement, um, because I think it, that you really put a, you know, really focused on what we need to be focused on. But I want to go back to the Secretary. Madam Secretary, you were talking about training and that you, you, and you see your role is making sure that people are trained. I don't think that you 
were, and you, as a matter of fact, you said so that private industry can do its thing. Um, and then, Mr. Pompeo, and I have read your statement, and you specifically say that uh, you said, after all, the fountainhead for innovation and entrepreneurial activity is the private sector, not the government. I am reading from your, your written testimony. Um, so what, t define your role again for us so we will be clear, as you see it as labor t in this. Yeah, Mike. It is uh, to provide assistance, to facilitate the placement of employment, and to make sure that we provide the necessary skills that industries, employers want. And that is where the gap seems to be. We are changing from a very heavily manufacturing industrial society to one that is emerging into a cleaner, efficient. We are seeing robotics. We are seeing so many new applications. Technology in and of itself has reformed the way we do business. You need fewer employees to get things done. That also has an impact. But those individuals with more certificates, with more advanced training in the STEM area are the ones that have lower rates of employment. So our, our uh, impetus is to make sure that we can spread the training, education, so that everyone has choices, and not just a job, but a career and a profession. Thank you. Uh, we now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mack. Thank you, and Mr. Chairman. Could you yield me 30 seconds? I would be happy to yield to the Chairman. Mr. Poneman, I am going to be very brief. Uh, Mr. Kucinich went on for quite a while apparently reading off of your website that has a timeline uh, on Solyndra's loan. Don't you think it is disingenuous for that timeline to be quoted when, in fact, what is missing from that timeline is January 13th, when the Bush administration recommended killing that loan, and January 26th, when the Obama administration brought it back to life and funded it? of 2009. In other words, one of the last acts of the Bush administration was to kill Solyndra as not a good idea. One of the first acts of your administration was to put it back in, and it is not on the site. Don't you think that is disingenuous? Uh, uh, with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, I don't think uh, there is anything disingenuous. The okay. So you will leave, no, you'll leave out so that, so that a, a distinguished member of this committee can misconstrue what actually happened and state before this committee without your objecting that basically this was all a timeline and they would have happened under Bush. I am sorry, but nope. I don't have any more time and you don't have an answer on that. Mr. Mack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and before I begin, I want to show a quick little video. Clean energy future. The loan to Solyndra Allow you, will allow you to build a new manufacturing facility, and with it, almost immediately. The gentleman will suspend. Can we uh, can we get that brought up to full volume before we begin again? Because uh, I, I don't think anyone could have heard Mr. Uh, Vice President Biden. I apologize. Audio video is not always as good as it could be here. He's saying that's full volume. Jobs. And once your facility opens, there will be about 1,000 permanent new jobs here at Solyndra and in the surrounding business community, and hundreds more to install. All right, well, since we really can't hear, <laughs> basically what the Vice President has said is that uh, uh, there were going to, this, this uh, loan, uh, this company, there was going to be 1,000 permanent jobs. So, um, Mr. Poneman, and did I, did I say that right? Close? You did, but you can call me anything, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, are those uh, jobs still permanent? Uh, regrettably, uh, no, Congressman. But I want to be very clear about w w one but thing. That's okay. I, 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 let, me, let me just. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, on January 9th, the Credit Committee remanded f for further consideration and additional due diligence the cylinder loan. It, it, Deferred it without prejudice, explicitly without okay, prejudice. So, so let it me, did not, in fact, kill. Let, let that me let me say this then. Considering that when the vice president made this announcement in September 2009, the Department of Energy already uh, was worried about Solyndra. Uh, uh, was it appropriate for the vice president to promise that these jobs were permanent? Was it appropriate for that? Congressman, at the time the Vice President made those statements, there was every hope that uh, those jobs would remain permanent and we are trying to build a, a, a new economy that will have many more jobs like it. Didn't uh, DOE and OMB have models showing that Solyndra would run out of money 
uh, it needed to sustain itself by September 2011? I would have to see the specific uh, studies that you are talking about, Congressman, but the, uh, as many startups have challenges, Solyndra obviously we'll, was no exception. We will we'll make sure we get those to you. I Thank think you very much. The record is pretty clear on that. Uh, Secretary Solis, uh, in your prepared testimony, uh, you talked about a gentleman named uh, Peter Reyes. Uh, who is Peter Reyes? Peter Reyes is, uh, Congressman, Peter Reyes is an individual that I met when I was touring a facility, a transportation facility up in San Jose. He uh, was a worker there, was telling me about his experience. He worked in the um, banking in, uh, industry, lost his job after many years, and was trying to get into a new job. So he was picked up by our training programs that we offer in the State of California in San Jose and became a part of the um, uh, production there and, and actually was a dri is a, now a driver for one of their hybrid uh, did, buses. Did, so now he's, you know, he's did, making money. Did, he's okay, back did, at work. All right. Did the U.S. taxpayers uh, pay for that training, for his training? In part, yes. Yes, we did, um, all along with the okay, state. Okay, so, here, so, here, so here's, but here's the real question. What makes driving a hybrid bus a green job and driving another bus that's not a hybrid bus, not a green job? I mean, and I, bear with me here for a minute. Driving a bus is driving a bus, right? I mean, you turn the wheel, you push the gas, you use the brake. If you go back to you use your blinkers. Pardon me, but if you go back to the to the argument that's being made of how you substantiate the green industry, the vehicles that were built there are hybrid vehicles. They're fuel efficient. They're built in Oakland, yeah, California. Yeah, but this is the bus but this is the bus this is the bus driver. By individuals. But this is a bus driver. So the question uh, the, so here's the problem that I think people are having that I'm having. How can you call this a green job? I mean, so if you sit in a chair, if I'm sitting in a chair that was made uh, out of green material, does that make my job green? He's in an I mean, industry. He, is, he is driving a bus, and to count it as a green job, you know, we, we've heard on the committee from both sides, we want to be able to make some determinations here, but before we can make those determinations, we have to get at, at uh, whether or not the information that you're giving us is, is accurate. And I don't it think is any. No, no, driving a bus. Just because it's hybrid doesn't make it a green job. Mr. Congressman, would you rather have that person unemployed? No, I'd rather where the them work. Taxpayers would have but to pay I would for rather, that. He's I would now rather paying you, taxes. I would rather revenue. you not try to smooth this thing over and make it a green job when it's a job. It's of course, an industry we want jobs. Green. But we don't want you to pull the eye, the wool over the eyes of the American people and tell them it's a green job when it's a job. And that is the problem the here. So the, so the administration wants to spend all of this money creating green jobs, but yet you will count things that is just that is a job. The industry itself, where he is employed, is fuel efficient. They are using new is technology. Is his job green? And the training Is his job received, green? Yes, it is. Driving a hybrid bus. Because so somebody who drives a bus that is not a hybrid, is that a green job? I would ask you to um, no, answer refer my to the definition answer my question. that BLS if someone, has provided If someone us. drives a, a bus that is not hybrid, is that a green job? You can't, you can't, is you can't green. answer it. It's only a green job if it fits into your sales pitch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank the gentleman and the gentlelady. We now go to the gentleman from Chicago, Mr. Quigley, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I yield to the ranking member. The, uh, Mr. <coughs> um, Papillon, did you finish answering the chairman's question? There was a question that you were trying to get an answer. Answer yes. to, and I thought, did, are you straight? Did you get it out? Yes, sir. I just wanted to be clear that the uh, matter was remanded without prejudice for further due diligence, and it was not killed uh, outright. Thank All you. Right. And just one other question to Ms. Secretary Solis: Could you just further elucidate on what you were just saying with regard to the truck driver? I understand that he's working Plus. for the industry. Yes, student. yes, and it is it is. Uh, Transportation Authority that has employed uh, energy efficient vehicles that were purchased and manufactured in California. And I would say to you, yes, this is a green sector job. 
It is one uh, where he received training. I did outline that BLS, again, and BLS does in their analysis uh, define mass transit industry as part of the green sector. So I don't understand why uh, someone is trying to say that I am misleading the public when we are not. I yield back to the gentleman. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Yes, reclaiming my time. Um, Mr. Cooper did a good job um, discussing the fact that these other industries are subsidized, too, talking about coal. Uh, clearly, we, uh, all, we know all too well about gas and oil and the subsidies there. Uh, nuclear, the nuclear industry was massively subsidized, particularly at the beginning, given direct subsidies, patents, limits on uh, liability, an extraordinarily cozy oversight process. Uh, all these industries are difficult to get going, and we have to recognize that. But uh, if the panel could take a few minutes and recognize, in addition to the subsidies to the existing um, manufacturers of energy, uh, there is also a, a cost that we are not taking into consideration. Now, I live in Chicago, which is the um, uh, asthma, morbidity and mortality capital of the United States. We have two coal-burning power plants from the 50s that are literally causing deaths there. So at least we could touch on the fact that there are alternative costs, not just the subsidies to these industries and to the green industries. Thank you for that question, Congressman. And it responds also, I think, to uh, Congresswoman Bur uh, Burkle's question as well. We have massive amounts of coal in this country, and we are going to continue using it. It still provides about 45 percent of our electricity. But as you suggested, Congressman, we have got to clean it up. Under the Recovery Act, we've invested, we are investing $3.4 billion in just that task so we can get clean coal competitive and clean uh, our environment at the same time. As we are sitting here today, Secretary Chu is in an international meeting uh, discussing carbon sequestration with other countries so we can not only be competitive but get the best technology deployed so we can clean up the coal and, uh, and continue to get the electricity from it, but also preserve our health. Thank you. L let me uh, move on to something else. The uh, American Energy Council, Innovation Council, led by Bill Gates, is urging us in Congress to make smart Federal investments in clean energy research and development now. He is backed by many other CEOs, including uh, Bank of America Chairman Chad Holliday, uh, CEOs and COOs, who are asking Congress to infuse our economy through Federal investment in these sorts of programs. So I guess if you don't necessarily believe what you deem a liberal congressman from Chicago, uh, there are national experts in private industry, industry leaders who agree with what you are trying to do. Congressman, this is a very important study because these are innovators. These are the people who not only know that private capital is the driver of innovation and growth, but they have actually done it successfully. And they say where there are certain market imperfections, that is the place for government to play a stimulative role, correct those imperfections, and help get the new green economy built and win America's future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I yield back. Uh, excuse I, me. I yield to Mr. Connolly. Thank you. Uh, thank you for yielding. I just, uh, you know, the premise of this hearing is uh, how Obama has the green uh, energy uh, program has killed jobs. So, how many jobs have you killed, Secretary Solis? We've actually helped to create jobs, and in in that, oh, so the we're premise, training individuals. So the premise is wrong. Huh? Well, in my in my. I, I, are you familiar with the Council of State Governments that says in one quarter alone we created last uh, in, uh, in last year we created fifty one thousand green jobs? That's the, the that's not the Obama administration saying it, it's the Council of State Governments. I would ask uh, that this be entered into the record at this point. Without objection. I thank the chair. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that we include in the record, based on testimony. The uh, email produced by OMB from January 13th, which says, in part, uh, after canvassing the committee, it is a unanimous decision not to engage in further discussions with Solender at this time. Also, the January 26th uh, email, which says, in part, well, I'll just leave it, leave it as it goes the other way and the March 10th one, which says in parts, DOE is trying to deliver the first loan guarantee within 60 days from the inauguration. 
the prior administration could not get it done for four years. Without objection, so no, ordered. No, I, I, objection. And Only I would, because I don't have it. I, I don't, I, well, I don't you don't have something until I ask to have it put in the record. It has been produced. Well, I mean, I, 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 mean, I can't Are you object to something that I don't see. I just want to see it. Here you go. <laughs> I ask unanimous consent to. Uh, I object until I can see it. Mr. Poneman, are you are you aware of these emails? And no, can you, sir. No, sir. I'm even not. though they were DOE emails, I, I did not arrive until uh, I was sworn in in May, sir. Can we get copies? Uh, but I'd be happy to review anything you would wish to uh, have reviewed, sir. Okay, uh, I would ask you to to verify the these for the record. I will mention in part, and the gentleman has no further objection, that they were produced to the Energy and Commerce Committee, and uh, these are copies received from them. With that, we go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold, for five minutes. Thank you very much. And I, I did want to talk a little bit about the green jobs. I'm, I'm all for jobs, whether they're green, brown, pink, purple, yellow. Uh, it doesn't matter. But it seems like, uh, again, and certainly it's from somebody from Texas, this really hits close to home, that we are focusing on green jobs at the expense of the traditional oil and gas industry and traditional um, uh, petrochemical, coal, and the like. Uh, I, I'm a supporter of an all-of-the-above energy policy, but we see all of this effort going into what is a green job and what is not a green job and, and, and generating energy, which is the key to this uh, economy. So I, I want to ask Mr. Poneman, the CRS has reported that the U.S. has access to more energy and natural resources than any other country in the world. Do you, do you agree with that? I have to see the study, sir, but, but we have uh, tremendous uh, resources uh, in hydrocarbons, uh, natural gas, uh, oil, uh, and coal, as well as the other resources. Do you believe we should, should forsake those resources uh, for uh, green energy? Absolutely not, Congressman. I'm, I'm glad you uh, call for an all-of-the-above uh, policy. We strongly believe in that, and I think we're putting everything in, in place to promote our uh, hydrocarbon sector as well as these. Are. We, we need all of these energy sources. Uh, how do you then explain some of the policies that we see coming out of this administration with the slowdown in leasing, the perm permitorium on uh, offshore drilling, a call for punitive uh, taxes on the uh, oil and gas industry? Congressman, I think we actually have a very strong uh, policy. Of course, uh, we, and I'm sure you as well, want us to uh, exploit these resources safely and to take into account best practices and to learn, learn the lessons from Macondo. But we are proceeding with offshore and onshore leasing. We, I've just participated in a new uh, interagency committee. The President mandated to look at Alaskan resources, and we intend to have a very robust policy. We had the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board just look at the natural gas sector and make sure that as we proceed with a you know, prodigious uh, shale gas resource that we proceed in a responsible, uh, open, transparent manner so we can continue to uh, enjoy the confidence of the American people. So you are suggesting that some of these new technologies for the shale gas that have been used in Texas for as much as 60 years uh, aren't fully understood? Uh, I am saying that I think we have got a very good report in from a, uh, an expert committee that talks about things that we could do to improve the public transparency so we have a wide well, Let me go on, because I, I have another line of questioning, and I have used up more than half my time already. Uh, are you, Mr. Poneman, are you acquainted with a gentleman by the name of Steve Spinner? It does not ring a bell. Uh, well, a Department of Energy spokesman told the Los Angeles Times last Friday that Mr. Spinner acted as a liaison between the Recovery Act Office and the Loans Program Office. His LinkedIn profile claims that uh, he reported to the Secretary and was responsible for strategic operations of loan and loan guarantees, including uh, renewable energy. As the Deputy Secretary of Energy, you didn't know him. No, no. Uh, your your uh, references, I, I, th I think I may have met him, yes. I'm not sure. so, so you didn't interact with him frequently, though? Uh, it would not have been somebody I dealt with right. well enough to remember. Well, Mr. Spinner was the CEO of a sports and fitness company and investor in Internet companies before working at the DOE. Uh, so no one ever questioned his qualifications to come to the DOE? I, I don't know that, sir, but I'm happy to check. Uh, were you aware that Mr. Spinner was also a bundler for uh, President Obama, raising over uh, $500,000 for Obama's 2008 campaign role? No, sir. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I will uh, yield back. Thank you. The gentleman is actually, would the gentleman yield? Sure. Thank you. Um, so again, I, I want to follow back, follow back up on this question about 
uh, green jobs. You know, we, I think we want to, whether it's like someone earlier said, w we just want to create jobs. But we certainly don't want to make an appearance to the American people that, that uh, a program is working uh, and by padding the statistics. Uh, and, uh, Madam Secretary, with all due respect, the idea of counting a job as a green job for driving a hybrid bus is, it's a, as, when people watch this hearing, it's offensive. It's offensive because they, they know that they're not being told the truth. And they want, they want the truth. The American people are smart. And if you give them the truth, they can determine whether or not this is a good thing or not. But if you pad the numbers to try to make it look better for you uh, at the expense of the taxpayers, it's offensive. And so we, we want to have a debate about whether or not it, it really is working. But when you pad the numbers in such a way, it's, it's very difficult to have a, a debate about that. My could, time has expired. Could BLS the, the, gen the gentleman from... Well, I didn't. I didn't say that. Well, if you want to, Mr. Welch, you're recognized uh, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll start up by letting you answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Um, I would just say again, I, in reference to the BLS, they do identify mass transit, this industry, as a part of the green service area. When it reduces pollution or conserves natural resources, that's exactly what the buses are doing. That's exactly what the uh, vehicles that were built in California and were remanufactured. This is a whole new industry, and I think that it is a positive direction that the President has outlined that we should be making investments in. Right. Thank you. Uh, I, I agree with many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle that any job we need energy, uh, any jobs we can create in the energy sector we should. Uh, governmental policy is very active in the carbon-based energy field, uh, and there is now some activism in the uh, so-called green sector. Uh, and by the way, China, as I understand it, is making massive investments in creating hundreds of th thousands of jobs. Uh, I also think it's a fair question that uh, uh, Mr. Mack asked, how do we do the accounting? People want to have credibility on it, and I'd have no reservation whatsoever uh, trying to figure out what do you want to call a green job, and uh, some are more questionable than others. That probably is true in uh, the carbon energy field as well. But it's a fair point, I think, and I'd encourage our, our department to work so that we're all talking off the same page. But I, I just want to give an example of something that's really working in Vermont. You know, uh, there's a lot of focus on Solyndra. We've got to get to the bottom of it. Um, I understand one of the issues there is that the investments that China made uh, 